What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we're talking about training to failure. Now, I recently had Brad Schoenfeld on our podcast, The Beauty and the Geek. By the way, if you're not listening to our podcast, link in the description, you guys gotta go check it out. And we talked a lot about training to failure. You've got kind of two different dichotomies when it comes to training to failure. There are some people out there who never train hard. They go in the gym and they slap one plate on each side of whatever they're doing and they do 10 reps of it and they go, oh wow, I sweat a lot during that workout. It must've been a good workout. Well, shucks. I'll do the same thing again next week and the week after that, the week after that, the week after that. And they're shocked when their body doesn't change. Contrarily, you've also got hardcore gym bro, Steve. Sorry, Steve, I don't know why I picked that name, but. And Steve comes in and is like, any set that you don't go to absolute failure is a waste of time. Absolute waste of time. You gotta take it to failure. In fact, you gotta do forced reps and drop sets and all that other stuff. Now, for me, I don't know about a lot of you, but I like to read the research on this stuff and say, hmm, you know, I really value data over my feelings about certain things. Now, certainly there have been people who have built extremely impressive physiques taking every working set to failure. However, train to failure has some downsides. Train to failure is more fatiguing than not training to failure. So when we are incorporating resistance training, one of the things we wanna do is manage our stimulus versus fatigue. Ideally, we can have maximum stimulus with minimum fatigue. Why? Because if we have maximum stimulus with minimum fatigue, it means we can initiate maximum stimulus again a few days later and continue to get maximum stimulus without feeling so beat up that you don't even wanna to go to the gym. Or if you do go in the gym, you've gotta lighten the load so much that it no longer is really that effective of a workout or your movement pattern changes because you're so sore and you end up getting injured because you're out of your normal movement pattern. What does the research say about training to failure? Well, much of the original research actually showed that training to failure was superior than training to not failure. But part of the problem with that research was it was not volume equated, meaning they were typically taking people and having them do a set load and either taking it to failure or not taking it to failure. And they found that people taking it to failure gain, got a little bit more gains. But the problem is if you're taking it to failure, you're doing more reps. So the volume is not equated. When they did studies that started equating for volume, they didn't really see any differences between failure versus non-failure, so long as the sets were sufficiently difficult. Now, what is determined as a difficult set? There's a lot of debate about this, but for the most part, we think that you've really got to get close to failure in order to get a lot of the benefits. And this especially applies to when you're using low load isolation movements. So if you're not using a heavy load and you're doing an isolation movement, you probably need to get within two, three reps of failure to really get the maximum stimulus. Whereas if you're doing something like a compound exercise, like squats, deadlifts, bench press, something very compound, uh, you can probably stay further away from failure and still get a lot of stimulus because it is such a large movement. Now, what, what's my practical advice? The research seems to indicate that if you're within two or three reps of failure on most exercises, you're pretty much capping out the benefits. Now, I'm not saying never train to failure, but if you can stay a rep or two or three shy of failure, you're getting most of the benefits, but you're also not taking your fatigue so high. Mike Israeltel was on our podcast as well, and he, he made a really good point. Anyone who's ever taken a set of squats to absolute and utter failure for like, say, a set of 10, and I'm not talking about the kind of failure where it's like, oh, this feels hard, I'm gonna stop. I'm talking about the kind of failure where you're sniffing ammonia, going to the dark place and deciding that you're gonna let your soul leave your body in order to get as many reps as possible. Those real Gs know what I'm talking about. Critics of not training to failure would say, well, you're training like a wuss if you stop a rep or two shy of failure. So you're telling me that feeling of utter collapse, and I can think of a very specific set. One of my top sets I've ever done was 480 pounds on squats for 14 reps. And I, at the end of it, I couldn't even re-rack the bar because I couldn't stand fully erect to get the bar back up on to the J-hooks. And I had to have two people come from the other side of the gym and rescue me. And then I collapsed on the floor for 15 minutes and could not move. You're telling me if I stopped one rep shy of that, 
I got no benefit. Are you telling me that it wasn't that difficult? Are you out of your mind? What is the benefit of stopping short of failure? Well, if we take something like that set of squats, doing that 480 for 14 reps, uh, uh, if you told me to get back under that 10 minutes later and do a single rep, I doubt I would have been able to do it. Maybe I could have gotten a rep or two. But if I had stopped at 10 reps, I probably could have done another set of 10 and then maybe even another set of 10. So what do you think actually provides more stimulus? Well, the research suggests it's actually getting in more total volume as long as the sets are sufficiently difficult. And that would be a sufficiently difficult set because you're within a few reps of failure. So when is it okay to train to failure? Because some people do like to train to failure and I do think it's good to train to failure on compounds every once in a while because if you've never trained to failure, you don't know what failure feels like and you're not gonna be able to accurately assess, hey, how many reps am I from failure? I know that a squat can move pretty slow for me and I'm still a few reps away from failure because I know what failure feels like. I know what that feels like. I know how slow I can grind out a rep on my last rep of squats. So I think it's good to do that every once in a while, but for the most part, if you're talking about compound high fatigue exercises, like squats, deadlifts, bench press, I would almost exclusively stay two to four reps away from failure because the fatigue is so high with training to failure on those particular movements that it's going to negatively impact subsequent sets and subsequent sessions. Now, again, I think doing it once in a blue moon, you know, every couple of months to kind of like have a mini test of yourself to see where your strength is at, that's fine. And also to understand where failure is at, that's fine. But it should not be anywhere near the bulk of your training. Now, when it comes to things like hack squats, rack pulls, machine press, dumbbell presses, you know, things that are still high stimulus but not quite so high fatigue, I think you can get a little bit closer to failure, one or two reps away, maybe even taking a set here or there to failure every few weeks. But I would recommend doing it on your last set for that particular exercise. On isolation movements, think leg extension, leg curl, calf raise, bicep curls, chest flies, those sorts of things. I think it's probably fine to get up to, you know, one rep shy of failure for a, a good bit of your training. And then maybe even taking a few sets here or there every week or two to absolute failure on your last set for that particular exercise. So it's not negatively impacting subsequent sets. Again, if you do your first set to failure, you're gonna start seeing it tail off. I mean, I can tell you that if I did a set of bench press to failure at like 10 reps, if I put the same load on, the next set I might get like three or four reps. Bench press isn't as fatiguing as squat, but I still might only get three or four reps with the same load. So in order to hit those reps, I'm gonna have to significantly lighten the load. Whereas if I had just done sets of seven or eight, I probably could have hit all three sets with that particular weight. That is a much greater stimulus than just going balls out and taking every set to failure. In fact, a lot of the people who train this way are very strong advocates for low volume. Their case being, well, if you only take it, if you take it to absolute failure, you don't need to do anymore. That That's getting the wrong correlation. They're not able to do anymore after they've taken it to absolute failure and therefore they don't. So my recommendations, if you're going to train a failure, Recommend doing it on isolation exercises on your last set every once in a while. If you're gonna do it on compound exercises, really try to limit it to mostly machine movements or like assisted movements. If you're going to do it on big barbell compound exercises, it should be once in a blue moon and exclusively for testing to see where your strength on that particular exercise is. And it should not be done as a training program. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Please like the video if you liked the video, subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our educational material, our training coaching web app, the Workout Builder. So if you guys don't wanna to have to figure all this stuff out for yourself, guess what? We tell you how many reps to leave in reserve on various exercises. So go down there in the description, click on the Workout Builder, $12.99 a month for over 50 customizable training templates, and we have more being updated all the time. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next week.